Now, the possibility of world temperatures hitting the critical 1.5 degrees centigrade rise of global warming within the next five years is now 50-50 and increasing. That's according to the World Meteorological Organization, which has warned that climate impacts will become increasingly harmful for people and the entire planet. Scientists conducting the research added that our oceans will continue to become more acidic with levels set to rise even further, while there'll be an increased likelihood of more frequent chaotic weather events happening with a 93% likelihood that at least one year between now and 2026 becoming the warmest on record. Now, for more on this, I'm joined by Andrew Parnell, a professor at the Hamilton Institute at Maynooth University, specialising in statistics and large structured data, as well as climatology. And we're also joined by Ocean Coughlin, Director of Friends of the Earth. Good morning and welcome to you both. Now, morning. Good morning, Pat. Andrew, uh, first of all, it's a, a bit of a struggle to cope with 50-50. I mean, if you had a 50-50 chance of crossing the road and getting knocked down, uh, you wouldn't cross the road. Uh, however, there doesn't seem to be the same urgency attached to these kind of numbers when it comes to climate. Yes, that's absolutely true. And this 50-50 is increasing. Uh, I mean, I think the, the last report they had of the, the sort of five years ago had sort of a zero, then going up to a 20% chance. And we've drawn this line in the sand at one and a half C. And uh, this, there, as you point out, there are cars driving across that line of sand and we are marching quite uh, quickly towards it with no sign of hesitating or stopping at all. Um, and it's getting worse. Now, how do they work out these um, statistics? You know, 93%, 50%, 70% chance of this or that? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so what they do is they take these very fancy climate models that they've been building over the last 20, 30 years. They run on supercomputers. They run in these uh, controversial data centers that we, we hear so much about these days. Um, and uh, they run them with their best guesses of what they think the climate system and how it works. Uh, but they twiddle with little bits of it. So um, different centers around the world have, have their different favorite climate models that they have built. And, and there, are, there are minor little uncertainties still in these climate models, say the effect of, I don't know, clouds on the degree to which that will affect warming. And what they do is they, they take, you can imagine these, these um, big climate models as being a big fancy computer, and they take a little knob on that climate model and they turn it down a little bit or up a little bit, and then they run them multiple times. So you can imagine they might run one of these climate models five years into the future. And they do that 100 times with slightly different sort of twiddling of the knobs. And then they found that if you look five years from now, 50 of those 100 runs have gone up above one and a half C and 50 of them haven't. So that's how they've decided mm. on those 50-50 numbers. Yeah. Now, I think when I read it, they, all, all of the ones they tried um, for the la latest report fell between 1.1 and 1.7 C. So they're actually pretty close. There aren't many knobs left to fiddle with and they don't seem to change things much anymore. Yeah. Do they have any sense of guilt at all about using those data centres to crunch so many times <laughs> using so much energy? I do. I mean, it, I mean, for me in particular, who works on the kind of uh, intersection between climate science and data science, but I also work in other areas. I work in 3D printing and cancer research and smart agriculture. And on a daily basis, I am using these uh, data centers to, to crunch some of these numbers. And I can't, I don't have a way around that. I mean, we can use tools of, of maths and blackboards a little bit to help us, but we really need these, these big computers to actually work out some of these. Mm. And I know we, we have that saying these days that data is the new oil of the 21st century. And I don't think that's actually a glib saying. I think that's that's actually the, the kind of truth that has a downside to it, it has a polluting cost to, to create these new data centers. And we need to we need to think think deeply about whether, whether we how we use those and how we um, power yeah, them. how we power them. I mean, if you can power them with uh, alternative energies, uh, solar and wind and so on, and even wind converted back to hydrogen, which is then burned to produce water, then they become neutral or even positive in terms of uh, their use. That would be fine. But we're nowhere near that point yet. I don't think so. I mean, they're, they're being built in Ireland. I think they're going to be built somewhere. If we didn't have them in Ireland, they'd be somewhere else. Um, and, and often, I mean, as, as we use computers every day, I don't think we even realise where half of the crunching, where, where our Netflix movies are stored, where the Amazon website is running. Um, we, don't, we don't really know where those things are, but they're being powered by data centres. Um, if we could have them in Ireland, I haven't got a huge problem with that, provided absolutely, as you say, we try and do that as, as efficiently and, and um, as energy neutral as possible. And so every time you share something on Facebook, you're contributing to the rise in temperature. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, 
let's let's not get too guilty here. We're all hypocritical in the way we've dealt over the in the past about climate change and our emission strategies. And we all need to do more. We need to put pressure on governments and we need to do more ourselves. And there are a load of, of simple tricks that we can we can do with our lives, which we all know about these days. I'm sure Ocean can, can tell us some more of them. Um, that we all know that we should be doing to try and reduce our carbon footprint. Mm. And we absolutely must do this because this report is going to get worse again next year and worse again. Okay. Year so so to, to borrow though from the oil industry, you've got a super tanker. Uh, it's very hard to turn it round. It takes miles and miles and miles if you try to even stop a, st- a super tanker in its tracks, never mind turn it round. And the analogy might be that what has happened is that super tanker and it'll be very difficult to turn it round because the direction of travel is already predetermined. Yeah, I mean, so th- so there are different elements of the climate system, some of which are smaller boats, which are easier to turn around, and some of them are like sea level, which really is a super tanker, which we just will not stop in the in the near future. Um, if we if we do reduce our emissions, um, we can certainly bring down, and we do still I do still have some hope that we might still meet our Paris Agreement's targets if we really start to properly cut back on emissions. But of course, I mean, all the things we're talking about here are mean changes, average changes in the climate. Um, and the, the thing that, that really happens is the extremes. We know we're going to get hotter, drier summers. We know that there are places around the world which will be much more deeply affected than Ireland will be by near term climate change. Um, and I've, we've just submitted a paper showing in Ireland that, that the extremes are going up by multiple times that the average is. And those are, those are the really hard things to, to stop and worry about. Mm. Um, So it does mean, though, that in terms of our uh, planning and so on, that we have to look at the extremes. Um, There's no point in in building something that's going to get flooded um, once every 10 years with huge implications for insurance and so on. Yes, absolutely. I mean, so so the mean can actually change by uh, not very much, but the extremes can can change by by actually quite a lot. Um, and so most of my current research is actually focusing on what's happening at the hotter, drier periods of the summer mm-hmm. um, and how are those, those are changing. And we're seeing those go up at a, at a much quicker, quicker rate. I mean, Ireland, as always, is, is kind of been um, a little bit safe and removed from, from the worst effects of climate change. We've seen them much more in, in other parts yeah. of the world. And I think that will continue to, to happen. But I mean, the more research is coming out, and I spoke to you last week, I think, on sea level rise, showing that Ireland really is affected by these changes, yeah. especially in the extremes. So, so for most of the time, for most of Ireland, it's like the Goldilocks zone. It's neither too, too one way or too the other way. It's just OK. But the point is that from time to time, and that will become increasingly frequent, we will get more of those um, extremes, however short-lived they might be. Yeah, and I mean, and that links back to this report as well, because I think when they did their, their multiple models with the different knobs, uh, they actually allow things like El Nino involved. So this is like a periodic weather phenomenon which actually boosts global temperatures. So that 50-50 um, probability is actually including kind of extra weird weather phenomena. Um, so, so those kind of those, those kind of random events that can occur, um, and, and it looks like the, the chances that we're going to beat one of those record years of 2016, 2020, and I think 2016 was an El Nino year as well. I mean, then you're pushing up way beyond 50-50. I think it was something like a 90% chance that you're going to beat one of those years coming through. All right, uh, that's fascinating stuff. Uh, Andrew Parnell, who's professor at the Hamilton Institute at Maynooth University.